Are you sick of screens? I know sometimes it can feel like we're constantly pulling our students' eyeballs away from their phones, off the computer, and just trying to get them to connect. <laughs> but not this way, connect, this way, right? I wanted to share a few of my favorite hands-on activities that are no screens, for your Spanish classes. Hey, my name is Ashley, aka Senior Spanish, where I provide easy to use resources to save you time and energy while you're lesson planning. If you're new here, I wanna make sure that you know that links to everything that I mentioned will be down in the description box below. I just wanted to note before we get into this that these are hands-on activities, but they're not movement activities. And the distinction that I'm trying to make there is that these are things that students are going to do with manipulatives either at their desk or in like a smaller area, maybe on the floor, but it's not something where they need to be like up and moving around the room where you might need more space, or you know, maybe you have a class that can't handle like up and moving around the room kind of activities. These are contained, but still hands-on. Let me know if you wanna see a video on my favorite movement-based activities for Spanish class, and hopefully that distinction makes sense. Okay, hands-on activity number one are grid puzzles. And I've talked about grid puzzles before, I think in probably my station activity video, because they are one of my favorite station activities. Actually, all of these make really good station activities. Anyways, a grid puzzle is where students line up edges of the box next to each other until they make a grid. Here's an example of one that I have not cut out yet because I thought it would be easier for you to see if I hadn't cut it apart. Hopefully you can tell this is a family one, but you can see that it's just Spanish and English and they're lining up the edges. So like it says la abuela and then grandmother and then down here is his wife and la esposa and there's nothing along the edges. This is kind of an easier version of a grid puzzle because there are clear edges. One of the options that I like to do to kind of make it more challenging for them is to put words up on the other edges that don't have a match so they still have to find you know what are the edges and that sort of thing but it's just a little trickier okay that's just another option for you so what you would do is you would cut these all apart and you give students like a little bundle of them and they have to arrange them to make the grid the next hands-on activity I have for you is called Tabata Timeline, and I have a whole video on this one on my channel that I'll link for you down in the description box below. But the gist is that students will write a few statements from a story, and then they'll cut them apart so that they have a bunch of different cards on their desk, and then they're going to put them in order. Timeline, okay? This one does involve students getting up and moving around, but they're gonna just move from desk to desk, so it's a little bit more contained than some of those bigger movement activities like I mentioned at the beginning of this video. So what students are gonna do is they're gonna get to a desk, they'll read all the statements and they'll put them in order, and then when the timer goes beep, that's the Tabata part, they will rotate to the next desk. That's just a really quick explanation, so if you would like to hear more about how to do that activity, make sure you check out the video linked in the description for how to play Tabata Timeline with your classes. Hands-on activity number three are scrambled sentences. And I actually shared about this activity relatively recently in my reflexive verbs video, but I wanted to share about it again because it's a great hands-on activity. Side note, you are not allowed to judge my organization because it's not pretty. This is how I organize these. You see this? Yeah, organization at its finest. It's, it's fine. <laughs> It's not pretty, but it works, okay? Anyways, scrambled sentences are exactly what it sounds like. You write some sentences, and then you cut them apart, and students have to put them in order. Mine just look like this. I do 10 in a set. Sometimes I print the set more than once, depending on how many kids I have in my class. And I do put a number at the bottom of them. I don't know if you can see that okay, because mine are laminated, so they're a little shiny. These are all from set number five, so I know like if somebody leaves one on the floor, it's easy for me to get it right back into the little packet. And for this one, I did put the English translations on the outside of this, so that way I can use this for them to check their own answers if I wanted to, or if I was gonna be gone that day, they could do that. The next hands-on activity I have for you is called Trash or Treasure, and it's basically like a sorting or a true and false. It could be like a Venn diagram, it could be, right? There's a lot of different ways you can do it, but let's just talk about three. So option one would be to do this with vocabulary where you either write a sentence or you give them the definition and they read it. And if it is used correctly in the sentence, it's treasure. And if it's used incorrectly in the sentence, it's trash. Or if that definition doesn't actually match what it's supposed to be, trash, right? To do it for conjugation, kind of the same thing. You would write a sentence using that verb in the sentence. And like say you conjugated it incorrectly on purpose, that's trash. If it was conjugated correctly, they're going to sort it into treasure, right? They're just going to mix and match. To do this for a story, you would just write things that happened in the story or didn't happen in the story. And then again, they're going to sort to trash or treasure. To save yourself some prep time on this, have your students create the statements or have your students write sentences using the vocabulary and you can sort them into trash or treasure. You should have them label trash 
or treasure before they submit them so you don't have to be guessing and you know that sort of thing. You want them to make purposeful mistakes with the trash and treasure. The next option for you is the marker game and if you're not familiar with this it doesn't have to be a marker, it could be a stuffed animal, it could be pencils, it could be right water bottles, anything that students could just grab really quickly that's all you need to play with the marker game. So the way this works is that students are going to play in pairs. You could have them do it in small groups too, but pairs are really nice. You just put the marker in between the two of them and you are going to be calling out statements. If the statement is true, they're going to race to be the first person to grab it. And if the statement is false, they're going to not touch it at all. And you can do a point system if you want, or you can, you know, have them play on teams and there's a couple different variations for it. But that's kind of the gist is true, grab the thing, False, don't touch the thing. Ta-da! Next on our list of hands-on activities is Partner Matamoskas. And this is kind of a twist on that old fly swatter game. And the thing that I like about it the most is that since it's partners, everyone can play it at the same time. You don't have like, you know, 20 kids watching one kid trying to fly swat or watching two kids try and race to fly swat. Everybody's gonna play it at the same time. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna put a game board between two to three kids. You know, could do a small group. I prefer partners. Again, it's easier for them to play together and really see the game board. You're gonna call out either a Spanish word, maybe a sentence that includes a word that they're looking for. It could be an English translation, and they're going to race to be the first kid to touch it, or they could, you know, draw a line through it with their colored marker. There's a lot of different ways you could kind of have them claim that they were the first person to touch it and play. I do have a point scoring system for this. First person gets a point, second person doesn't get a point, and if they tie and they can't agree, I get the point. And the reason why I do that is because I have often experienced, especially with like my freshmen, they really struggled with this, like they couldn't agree on who was actually first, and I would say, mm, profe's point. So their score sheet said, you know, player one, player two, profe, and it was not uncommon for me to win without even playing, because they would be like, I won, no, I got there first, ah, and I'd be like, my point, you know, it also helped them kind of sort it out because they didn't, they didn't want me to win. Okay, the next hands-on activity I have for you are mini Corre en Circulos. I have talked about Corre en Circulos before on my channel and usually the way that you play is kind of a, <laughs> a regular sized scavenger hunt all the way around the room. But like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, some classes can't handle everybody being up or maybe you you know you literally just played Corre en Circulos last week and you want to do it again but you don't want it to be the same way the mini puzzle is a great option for that and first off I have a tutorial on my channel to explain how to print them mini in case that's something that you haven't done with your computer before it's super simple it's just two steps in your printing settings but what you're going to do is students are going to print them and then they're going to arrange them in a circle to answer the puzzle right because it's still un circulo once they're all done, it'll be a circle on their desk. And you can have them do this alone. You can have them do this in pairs. It works really well as a warm up or as a fast finisher. This set that I'm holding is from my Telling Time set that I actually have two versions of. So what I will often do is after students complete the big, the regular version, it's not big, it's just a regular size version, scavenger hunt around the room and they turn in that version, then they pick up the little version which is a little bit different and they play it on their desks while they wait for their classmates to finish. So that way they're still, you know, it's a classroom management strategy, right? So that way they're doing something and they're still working on this and they're getting that extra practice while other people are finishing the other assignment. What are your favorite hands-on activities to do with your Spanish classes? I just shared seven of my favorites, but I'd love to hear what other ones you would add to the list down in the comment section. And if you're looking for more ideas for activities you can do with your Spanish classes, I highly recommend checking out this video here. It's got 30 activities for focusing on delivering comprehensible input to your students, and it is fast. I am not wasting your time in this video. It's 30 ideas you could use right away. I will make sure to link that for you down in the description box below. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.